Welcome to Colorado Church, everyone. I'm so glad that you've joined us. Colorado Church is here to help people know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. So whether you're new to church or you've been here for years, you are welcome here. Now, whether you find yourself gathering with another person or another family, or if you're watching this service by yourself, I want to encourage you to engage with our service today. We believe that our weekly gatherings are a way for you to get to know God and to hear from Him. And one of the ways we'll receive that word from God is by engaging. So I want to encourage you to not just engage mentally, but challenge yourself wherever you are to engage physically. Stand up from your couch, lift your hands in worship, and engage in what God has in store for our time together today. So Lord, I just ask that you would bless every single person who's watching this service today. And you would help us to engage, not just mentally, but physically, to uh, get up off our couches, to raise our hands, even if we're listening to this service in the car. Lord, would you speak loudly to us so that we can hear you clearly, that we can recognize your voice. And Lord, help us to know you more through this service. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's lean in as we worship together. Raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies Raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a man Praise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me Sing I raise I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemy Come on. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar And up from the ashes Hope will arise The death is defeated The King is alive I raise, I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. And I will watch the darkness flee. And I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the mystery, I raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. Oh, and I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from me. Ashes, hope will arise. The death is defeated. The King is alive. Sing 
this out. Sing a little louder. 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 Oh 
us Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley Cause there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn morning to day. Turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn shame into garden You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You turn great Turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. Turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only one who can One more time You're the only one who can Lord, there's nothing Better than you Lord, there's nothing Better than you there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. There's nothing better than you. Let's pick it up. Here we go. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn great. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You turn graves into garden You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways you're the only one who can. 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 
Let's sing it out one last time. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Lord, we lift you up. That there is nothing better than you. That there is nothing higher than you. In Hebrews 1, you say that God, that Jesus is higher than the angels. That he is greater than the rest. That he was there at creation. That he was there and spoke the world into motion, Lord. Lord, you turn death into life. You turn shame into glory. You turn mourning for dancing, Lord. Lord, so take me and make me like you. Make me like you. Arise, day and night, 
night and day let incense arise day and night night and day day and night day and night night and day let incense arise day and night night and day let incense arise day and night night and day let incense arise day and night night and day Yes, Lord, sing day and night. Sing day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day. You're worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. For from you are all things, and to you are all things, you deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Let's keep going. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. From you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Heavenly Father, we give you our highest praise. And now, God, we ask that you would do in us and through us and with us what only you are capable of doing. God, we love you and we praise you. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, Colorado Church, I am so excited to be with you today. And I want to give you an update on the Mercy Project that we spoke about last weekend. And we wanted to reach out to the police officers uh, that we have relationship with and just be a blessing to them. And your generosity provided $3,000 to the Denver police officers. And so we delivered them care packages and they expressed their gratitude. And especially Sergeant Carla, she says hello to all of you. Hey, uh, once again, before we jump into the sermon today, I just want to highlight something that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. We are launching our fall semester of small groups on Sunday, September 13th. And so uh, sort of a last and final call out to any of you that want to lead a new group, but we still have, we currently have 30 small group leaders. And so there is a group for you to plug in with and I encourage you to do it. It'll change your life. It'll be the best decision that you make during a pandemic. How about that? So if you haven't done it, 
you can't say that I haven't told you to do it. So, hey, uh, there was a poem that stood out to me this week, and I just want to read it to you. It was written by a poet called Thomas Hood. He wrote this. I remember, I remember, the fir trees dark and high. I used to think their slender tops were close against the sky. It was a childish ignorance, but now tis little joy to know I'm further off from heaven than when I was a boy. This year has done its best to take from us our innocence. The roller coaster of politics and passionate cries for reform. They've disrupted our routines, right? Maybe you're feeling, like Thomas said, further off from heaven. Circumstance can bring confusion and confusion can complicate our spiritual disposition. I'm reminded of a meal I bought for someone who was going through a difficult time and I just want to share you, share with you a story. A few years ago, I reached out to a pastor who had just been fired. I bought him a burrito at Chipotle. Come on, people. Let's go meet at Chipotle after church. And I just, I just listened to him. I told him that he was going to make it through this and that the Lord was with him in this difficult season. I wanted him to be able to look back on that time and remember someone reached out, someone cared, someone loved him. And that is how I come to you today, just wanting to sit with you and turn our attention to the Lord. Some of us feel just like that young pastor did. Didn't know what was next, felt disrupted. It wasn't his fault. And I just want to sit with you just like I sat with him. You know, maybe you feel like 2020 has knocked the wind out of you. It's taken more than it's provided. And my heart for this message is that you feel my heart for you that we sit together and find encouragement in the Word of God and that in the few minutes that we have together, you feel the Spirit breathing over you. Last week I said, I believe 2020, this year, will be the year of the greatest transfer of spiritual wealth in our lifetime. Why? Because Jesus reveals more of himself to us in the midst of a storm. We talked about that last week. The disciples learned more about who Jesus was when he calmed the wind and the waves. They said, what manner of person is this? And they worshiped him. I defined spiritual wealth as knowing God, experiencing freedom from sin and from our past, and discovering our God-given purpose for our life. You know, Paul had the same intention when he wrote to the followers of Jesus in Philippi. So let me read to you out of Philippians, the second chapter, starting in verse 12. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. What a verse for today. So that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom, get this, you and I shine like stars in the world. So my first point is just not together. And when Paul writes this to the church at Philippi, he says, So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, Paul was writing to a group of people with whom he couldn't gather, just like us. The absence of our former spiritual rhythm in our lives is not an excuse for spiritual lethargy. So 
let me give you an example. I met with somebody this week who told me they didn't watch church online because it's pre-recorded. They still love our church. They still consider themselves an integral part of our church. But he just admitted, hey, I'm not watching it because it's not live. We find in the Bible a completely opposite perspective, right? Paul wasn't writing his letter while the people in Philippi were reading it. He wrote it months before they even received it. Paul expected the church in his absence to have the same level of holiness and spiritual passion they expressed while he was with them. So let's not allow our time apart to take us off the path of obedience. Paul uses that word obedience. Now, obedience is a word that has so many rigid connotations. It's it's a little bit too religious for today. But what Paul is saying simply is this, while I'm not there with you, keep doing what you did while I was with you which was walking in the way of Jesus. So can I echo Paul's words to us as Colorado Church? When we're not together, when I can't see you in the lobby, when I can't sort of come down off of the stage and, and preach standing right at the front row and, and, and spitting on the people that are too close, when I can't be there with you, then let's still do what we did when we gathered together in our weekly rhythm, and that was to walk in the way of Jesus. My second point, I I, I say, is owning your salvation. So Paul tells his friends, quote, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, a a couple other words that just are, are hard to understand in today's society and culture. What that means in today's language is this, honor our own spiritual journey with intentionality. You can say, let me, let me give you an example of this, of owning your own spiritual journey and giving it honor while being intentional with it. So here's, here's just an example. You can say that you're a lawyer. But if you never go to court, if you never work on a case, guess what? You're not a lawyer. You can say that you're in sales, but if you're not making calls, working deals, you're not a salesman. Again, if you say you're a gardener, but you never plant anything, never cultivate anything, you're simply not a gardener. Shall I continue? You can call yourself a cook, but if you only make microwavable meals, i got news for you. You're not a cook. Likewise, if we, if you and I call ourselves followers of Jesus, but spend no time working on our spiritual life, no time in the word, no time developing life-giving connections with other believers, we are not disciples. So it's time to own our salvation, just like Paul said. It's time to bring honor to our spiritual life by placing a priority on our own discipleship. Paul was calling the small church in Philippi to work on their own salvation, and that is what I'm asking for us. For too long, we have delegated and deferred our spirituality to the point that we have relied on a weekly gathering to feed us and fill us. That that weekly gathering was not a bad thing. But what has been revealed in this time is that some of us relied on that weekly rhythm to feed us and fill us, and we weren't doing it ourselves. For some of us, our personal and private worship was so weak that when church went digital, all we could do was complain. So you guys know, I I spent two months in Zambia, Africa. I actually did that uh, two summers in a row while I was in college. And while I was in Africa, I watched kids play soccer barefoot and not with a soccer ball that they bought at, at Walmart or a sporting goods store, but with a ball made of plastic bags and twine. 
because their love of soccer was not squelched by their poverty of circumstance. So let's not allow the absence of a weekly gathering to keep us from worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Worshippers worship and Jesus followers follow Jesus. It's what we do and it's what we should be doing. Let me take you to the 13th verse in Philippians. It says this, For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. So we recently had some work done in our house. So we got the house ready. We moved the furniture that was going to be in the way. And then lastly, a family our size, (laughs) we got out of the way of the workers, right? So if we believe what Paul says, that God is at work within us, then let's get everything ready for him to do the work and then let's get out of his way. So when we allow the Lord to do a work inside of us, he accomplishes two things. He enables us to desire spiritual growth and he enables us to work on our spiritual life. So, in order for us to work on our spiritual life, there must first be desire. It is the Lord who gives us that desire, right? Some of us haven't developed a strong enough spiritual life simply because we've lacked that desire. But what Paul tells us is that it's God who actually working in us gives us or gifts to us that desire. So let me give you a real practical example. Wives, you know, (laughs) you can tell your husband about a project that needs to be done around the house. He can see it. You can remind him. But until he gains the desire to do the work or the project, it simply won't be done. (laughs) So let's be a church that is asking the Lord for a greater spiritual desire during this season. He's working in us. And as he works in us, he gives to us a desire to go deeper spiritually. So verse 14 and 15 says this, do everything without grumbling and arguing, (laughs) right? Maybe... Should I, should I repeat that or should we just pause and let everybody copy that verse down and then put a magnet to the fridge so that we can see that um, more often? Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. So Paul is calling the church to be blameless and pure and faultless. He reminds them that they are not just people who have decided to believe the message of Jesus and follow his ways. But in so doing, we actually become children of God. When we decide to believe what Jesus says, something happens inside of us Our true nature and our true character is revealed. And we actually, the Bible says, are children of God. And you know what the Bible says about us being God's children? Romans 8, 19 says this. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. All of creation wants you and me to know God and to find freedom. All of creation desperately wants you and me to discover the purpose for our life. The reason we were placed on this planet for such a time as this, all of creation wants us to come alive to that. So let me say it this way. Remember when your childhood friend would return from vacation 
you would wait at the window expecting to see their family vehicle turn onto your street. A week or two apart from them was enough to make you burst at the seams with anticipation at their return. (laughs) I I remember when I was a kid waiting for my best friend who lived across the street from me that we had just played basketball, rode bikes, played baseball, uh, went down to the creek and to the pond and caught crawdads. Whenever their family would go away on vacation during the summer, it was the most boring week or two of my life. And I had this expectancy that they would return and that we could play and hang out together. And that's how all of creation waits for you and me to reveal that we are sons and daughters of God. Why? Because when we do everything without grumbling or arguing, we bring life into every situation and circumstance. When we are blameless, pure, and faultless, we shine and bring light and life to everything we participate in. But I'm working on this. And I actually, I want to confess something to you. I've been distracted and depressed by the events of our world. Maybe you have too. I've been present with people during this time and have been more concerned with getting my point heard than hearing from them. Headlines have dominated discussions when I should have been seeking what the Spirit wanted to do in that setting. So here is what I've done. And I'm not, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm just inviting you in my life and telling you that it's already helping me. I've made my smartphone as dumb as it can be. <laughs> There's there's no more social media apps for me to access. I took away the news apps so that I can't just check the news when I'm in between appointments. I can make phone calls and, and I can find places on Google Maps still, but that's about it. So if you haven't heard from me on social media, it's because I'm there less often. I'm simplifying in order to be more present so that my presence can be life-giving like Paul wanted from the church in Philippi. Paul promises in that passage that we will shine like stars. And when I read that this week, it, it reminded me of one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and it's, it's one found in the book of Daniel. Daniel 12, 3 says this, Those who are wise will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. You know, stars shine brightest in the darkness. As we press into the presence of the Lord, we will shine in this dark world. But you can't do this alone. We need one another. And on September 13th, next week, we are launching our fall semester of small groups. Like I said at the beginning, I want each of you in a group. Some of those groups are still virtual, but most of them are actually gathering in person. As several of you have begun to gather and watch church online together, we have provided a few questions to facilitate your conversation. You know, I, I've, I've started to realize that some of you are, are spending your weekends and, and sitting together and participating in church together. And, and I, I would encourage that. If you feel comfortable doing that, we all need each other. And uh, I think it's time for us to uh, wander outside of uh, isolation and gather once again in community. You know, one of the pastors that I listen to, he, he says this, when he first heard the term social distancing, he knew that it was not right. The, the term should have been physical distancing because socially we all need each other. And so 
we're going to start tossing out questions, uh, making those available to you for you to just dive deeper when you gather with families or friends or just even with your own family so that you can actually take the Word of God and, and plant it in your life expecting fruit. And so the, the three questions that I've just jotted down from my study uh, today is, what can you and I do to continue to work out our own spiritual life? Question number two is this, if God is working in you, what do you need to move so that he has freedom to work in your life? You know, I mentioned that we had work done in our house and, and I actually had to move the refrigerator. But for us to move our refrigerator, I had to ask for help. And so I asked and, and Noah, my, my oldest son, helped me move it. And you might, just even looking across the room, if you're meeting with uh, another person, you might say, hey, I need help moving something out of my life so that God has space to move in my life. So that question is, if God is working in you, what do you need to move so that he has freedom to work in your life? <laughs> and then my last question, I want you to look to the person next to you or across the room or the next person that you gather with, and I want this to be part of your conversation. Ask them, what small group are you in or what small group are you about to join? It'll change your life. I want you in it. I believe in it. I love my small group. I gather with the elders every single month. You guys would fight for their friendship and they are so valuable for me and for the church. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, I pray for an open heaven over everyone who's watching. God, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would keep them. I pray that you would be a speaking God. Speak to each and every one of us. God, we love you, we worship you, we honor you, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Love you. See you next week. Amen. Such a great message for us today. If you're at all like me, you probably know that even the best message doesn't stick if you're not discussing it with others. And so if you've gathered with others for service today, or if you're watching this service in your small group, we want to give you a chance to talk about what God is saying to each of us through this service and through Pastor Evan's message. So would you take a moment to think about these questions, the same ones that Evan just asked, and talk about it with whoever you've gathered with. Those questions were, what can you do to continue to work out your spiritual life? And if God is working in you, what do you need to move so that he has freedom to work in your life? And lastly, what small group are you in? Like Pastor Evan said, we are gearing up to start our fall semester of small groups next Sunday, September 13th. If you aren't already connected to a small group, we truly believe that you can find freedom from sin and from your past in the context of life-giving relationships through small groups. You can head to colorado.church groups to find our small group directory with information about each of the groups that are open this semester. We can't wait to see what God has in store for this next semester of small groups. Colorado Church, we love you and pray for you every single day. We'll see you next week.